The Science of Mind by Ernest Holmes, read by Reverend Michelle Ingalls, February 2nd. We should not, however, think of soul and spirit as separate from each other. They are really two parts or aspects of the same thing, each being self-existent and co-eternal with the other. The term subjective mind is used in speaking of the universal soul rather than the term subconscious mind to avoid the impression that subjective means unconscious. Mind never could be unconscious. The soul is subjective to spirit, receives impressions from spirit. The subjective mind, which we call soul, is not a knower in the sense that spirit is i.e. it is not self-conscious. It knows only to do without knowing why it does. It is a doer or executor of the will of the spirit and has no choice of its own. It is the business of soul to reflect the images that spirit casts into it. Subjective intelligence. The soul is immaterial as we think of matter, but it is the substance of spirit and perhaps we could use the expression, the matter of spirit. As all matter in the physical world is supposed finally to resolve into the ether from which it came, we may think of the substance of soul as we think of the ether of science and realize that all form finally becomes soul stuff again. Perhaps the simplest way we would be Perhaps the simplest way would be to think of it as the last and final analysis of matter. We continue to use this word in the face of the knowledge that scientists, in theory, have already done away with matter. We know that matter comes from somewhere, and the teaching is that soul stuff is the source from which it comes. We must, however, distinguish soul stuff, stuff from soul. Soul is subjective intelligence the principle just beneath spirit. For while soul may not have the conscious intelligence to choose, it certainly has the intelligence to execute the desire of spirit. It is never in any sense unconscious. The soul of the universe is next in principle to spirit and is the servant of spirit. The term soul stuff refers to the primordial or undifferentiated substance from which all things are made. While the soul may not choose, having no self-consciousness of its own, yet it has an intelligence which is infinite compared to the intelligence which we exhibit. For instance, the combined intelligence of the race could not create the life of a plant, yet the intelligence in the creative soil of the earth will produce as many for us as we ask when we plant the seed of that which we wish to have created. The same principle holds good in the greater creative medium of the spirit, which we call the soul of the universe. It has the intelligence and power to produce, but no choice as to what it is to produce. Having no conscious mind of its own, it receives all ideas given it and tends to create a form around them. If it could choose, it would reject and this is, an, this is as impossible as for the soul to say, you must not plant spinach this year, you must plant cauliflower. We can imagine what consternation would prevail throughout the world if just once the soil fa failed to function according to the law of its nature. We need not be disturbed by such a fear. It is bound to accept and to act. It does not argue but at once begins to create a likeness of the pattern given it. If we say petunias, right back to us, it says petunias and begins immediately the business of producing them. Being a neutral creative medium, which knows neither good nor bad, it is conscious only of its own ability to do. This is why some of the earlier philosophers referred to the universal soul or creative medium as a blind force, not knowing, only doing. This we know to be true of the nature of all law. We are not discussing the nature of the spirit. We are talking about law. It must be apparent by now that the creative me medium of spirit is the great mental law of the universe. It is the law obeying the will of the spirit. 
It is the universal law of mind. All law in mind in action. All law is mind in action. Soul is the medium through which all law and all power operate. Being subjective, it cannot analyze, dissect, or deny. Because of its nature, it must always accept. The karmic law, which means the law of cause and effect, works through the medium of the universal soul, which is the creative principle of nature and the law of spirit. Let us bear in mind that neither spirit nor the soul of the universe were ever created. Each is eternal because this impartial, impersonal soul is the medium through which spirit works, and because it is a blind force not knowing, only doing, it was called by the ancients Maya, from which arose the teaching of the illusions of the mind, the mirror of the mind. What is termed subjective mind, as the average, average person comprehends it, has no existence. In reality, there is no such thing as your subjective mind and my subjective mind. It is our subjective minds. If our subjective minds were isolated and things of themselves, we would be so completely separated that there would be no means by which we could communicate with each other. The next great bridge that psychology must cross is a recognition that what is called your subjective mind and my subjective mind is merely the place where universal subjectivity, the creative medium itself, reacts to our personal use of it. Within us, then, is a creative field which we call subjective mind, and around us there is a field which we call universal subjectivity. One is universal, the other individual, but in reality they are one. There is one mental law in the universe and where we use it, it becomes our law, because we have individualized it. It is impossible to plumb the depths of the individual mind, because it is not really individual, but individualized. Behind or within the individual point is the universal, which has no limits. In this concept alone lies the probability of an endless and an eternal expansion. Everyone is universal on the subjective side of life, an individual only at the point of conscious perception. We use the power of the universal mind every time we think.